When transitioning from scripting languages like JavaScript or Python to systems programming, you encounter a new world of unfamiliar concepts. The stack, the heap, pointers, system calls, locality, concurrency, parallelism, and more. It's well known that a significant portion of the JavaScript ecosystem is moving to Rust. But what's also well known is that a lot of people fail in this transition. Every so often, I find myself reading posts on Reddit where people seek help, resources, advice, or a guide on learning Rust. The best guide, of course, is the book. However, because the book is about Rust, it doesn't go into details on some concepts that are more tied to systems programming in general. With some effort, it is possible to learn Rust just from the book. But in my opinion, it is way easier when you understand all of those foot guns that the borrow checker is trying to save you from. To clarify, these videos I'll be making are not Rust tutorials. Instead, we will explore various low-level concepts that will help you to understand and appreciate many of the design decisions behind the language. Hi friends, my name is George, and this is Core Dumped. This video explores a fundamental trait of systems programming languages. Fixed size types. Perhaps the first thing you notice when you transition from Python or JavaScript to Rust or C is that you can't declare variables without specifying their type. Even with type annotations, you observe that in scripting languages, a numeric variable is defined simply as a number. Whereas in Rust or C, there are not only integers and floating point values, but different kind of each. Why? Well, in a few words, systems programming languages allow you to specify how much space in memory you want to use for representing your data. Let's take a look at what does that means. As you know, in the realm of computers, all information is represented as a sequence of bits, where each bit can be either zero or one. The idea of representing data in binary is to consider every possible combination of bits in the sequence and associate each combination with a particular value. For instance, if we want to represent numbers with a two bits long sequence, there are four possible combinations. So we associate these combinations with the values 0, 1, 2, and 3. But because we ran out of combinations, we can't represent the value 4. To solve this, we need to increment the length of the sequence. Doing so now makes the sequence able to represent up to eight different values. If that is not enough, we just need to keep adding bits to the sequence until we have enough combinations to represent our desire values. Notice that because every bit can take two and only two different values, every time we add an additional bit to the sequence, the range of values we can represent doubles. But why is that important to us? Well, when you run a program, all of its variables are located somewhere in memory, and memory is limited. The purpose of all of these types is to give you the superpower of telling the compiler, explicitly and precisely, how much space you need in memory to represent the information your program will use. For convenience, computers don't operate directly with bits, but rather groups of eight bits called bytes. This means the minimum number of bits you can use to represent something is eight. Also, this is why you commonly encounter eight, 16, 32, or 64 bit numbers, but not numbers with unconventional bit counts such as three or 47 bits. Let's see a little example of why the size of your variables might be important to you. Let's say in your program, you are trying to represent the age of a person, and you decide to go with a 64 bits unsigned integer, which uses eight bytes in memory. As you can see, a 64 bits long sequence is more than enough to represent an age, which in very rare occasions reaches a value above 100. However, if you remember, one byte has eight bits, and that means one single byte can represent up to 256 different values. And because an age will never even reach a value of 255, you will never use seven of those eight bytes. If all that memory region is not being used, you are simply wasting space. So in this case, an unsigned 8-bit integer is everything you need. In scripting languages, you don't care about any of this. When you declare a variable, is the interpreter's and not your responsibility to decide where and how much space in memory variables require. Potentially, and by this I mean almost always, you'll end up using a lot more memory than necessary. Now, if we talk about one single variable, seven unused bytes might not sound like a lot. After all, modern computers have gigabytes of RAM. But what if you are dealing with thousands of different ages? In that case, you will end up wasting a lot of space in memory. 
Moreover, Rust's typing system allows you to define if a number can be negative or not. Because ages cannot be negative, by using an unsigned integer, we are telling the compiler to reject any piece of code that attempts to assign a possibly negative value to the age variable. Another useful scenario where this enforced explicitness is useful is when operating different kind of numeric values. In JavaScript, you can do something like this. Just by looking this code, could you tell if the result will be an integer or a floating point value? Just by looking this code, could you tell if the interpreter will round the floating point before performing the operation? Or will it transform the integer to a float and then perform the operation? If you use JavaScript a lot, you might know the answer, and that is great. What is not great, though, is that your answer comes from your experience, or a documentation hidden somewhere on the internet, and not by any sort of information that this code is providing. In Rust, you can't do something like this. To avoid foot guns, you need to explicitly express what you are trying to achieve. And this takes us to the next topic of this video, performance. In scripting languages, once the interpreter assigns memory to variables, later when those variables are needed, how does it know what they are? Because remember, in computers, everything is represented as bits. If later in the program, we need to add those two values, there is no way to know if those bits are representing a number, a string, or anything else. There are multiple ways to solve this but the easiest one is to attach extra information to each value. Hence, if those values are needed later, the interpreter can first read that information to determine whether it has to perform a numeric operation in the case of numbers or a concatenation in the case of strings. A decent dynamic type system can also use this information to catch errors at runtime. For instance, if you are trying to add a string with a number, it can throw an error as Python does. A really bad language, though, won't tell you anything but rather implicitly convert one of the values and then perform any possible operation. Believe it or not, this bullshit that cannot be described but as undefined behavior is considered a feature. Anyway, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that none of this is magically done. First, these tags require extra space in memory. Here, Due to limited screen space, I'm illustrating them as if they take up only one single byte, but in real life, they actually require several bytes. Now not only do you lack control over the size of your variables, but the interpreter also uses additional memory for each of them. The second problem, and perhaps the most important one, is that this approach imposes a large overhead on simple arithmetic and other operations that manipulate data. These tags must be initialized, and that takes time. They must be read, and that takes time. They must be compared, and that takes time. Additionally, they must be written at runtime, and as you may guess, that also takes time. So all of these tasks require CPU time, which means that most of the time, the interpreter is executing all of those extra steps instead of executing your code. On the other hand, when you are required to provide information about the specific types and sizes of variables in your code, the compiler can use that information to emit very efficient machine code. In this case, for example, the compiler knows that these two variables that are going to be stored somewhere in memory at runtime are 32-bit numbers, so it will emit machine code that fetches both values, performs an addition, and then stores the result somewhere else in memory. And that's it. No additional memory used, no extra validations. All of this because you provided that information at compile time. And that's one of the main reasons why statically typed languages are usually orders of magnitude faster than dynamically typed languages, even those that are not systems programming languages. And there you have it. Now you know why the size of your variables matters. Finally, consider that because the size of primitive values is known at compile time, that means that the size of more complex values is also known at compile time. So, everything you just watched applies for your custom data types. Except, you don't always need fixed size types. For instance, consider this scenario. Here, the compiler will reject this code, because it doesn't know the size of the array. The solution here is to specify the size. However, this means that every time you initialize such a variable, you must provide exactly that many elements to the array. In this case, two. 
otherwise the compiler will complain. But there are situations where you don't know the size of the array at compile time, or simply is your intention for its size to vary at runtime. The solution to this is to use a special memory region where your array can grow or shrink dynamically. And instead of holding the array itself, your custom type holds a reference to that region of memory where the array is located, plus other information, like the size of the array, so we always know how big the region is. The reasons behind this limitation are beyond the scope of this video. From here, things start to get a little more complicated, because now, we have to consider these memory regions that you may have heard about before, the stack and the heap. However, those concepts deserve their own videos. So, consider subscribing if you want to learn more. If you learned something or just enjoyed watching this video, hit the like button. If you didn't like it, that's okay. As an AI model, I don't give a